Joining us right now is a gentleman who covers the Philadelphia 76ers for the Philly Inquirer, the one and only Mr. Keith Pompey. Keith, welcome. What's good, man? Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, thank you for your time. I needed your help uh, trying to make sense of something, right? So, mm -hmm. the Philadelphia 76ers draft Ben Simmons number one overall. Mm -hmm. He signs a contract for $177 million. They mm -hmm. put the ball in his hand, giving him an opportunity to create the offense. And you recently penned an article saying Ben Simmons' agent met with Philly Brass and they expressed that he wants out of there. He doesn't want to play there anymore. And he's willing to sit out training camp if he's not traded. Keith, why does Ben Simmons want out of Philly? You know, I, I think it's just a, I mean, it's one of those things where you, you know you're going to be traded. I mean, they tried trading him at the beginning of last year. Mm -hmm. um, he, he knows that. Uh, he knows that they're shopping him now. And it, it's just one of those things where I, I think that he feels like the relationships are unparable, uh, unrepairable. You know, he, he felt like he was thrown under the bus after they lost game seven. And, um, you know, it's just one of those things where I think that he looks at it that it'll be better off for him to move on. Excuse me. And he feels like, you know, they could have traded him this year, this summer, but they were, you know, asking for, uh, I'm talking about like crazy, crazy stuff in return. Mm -hmm. So he feels like it's not his fault that they couldn't trade him and he wants to be traded. You said he felt like he was thrown under the bus. How? Well, you know, when they lost the game, it was one of those things where, you know, there was a point where Doc Rivers was asked, do you think that you have a championship caliber point guard? And his response was, I don't know. You know, and, and you know, after the game, like, you know, Ben did pass up a shot. Mm -hmm. He passed up a wide open dunk. He, he shot 32% from the foul line throughout the whole series. But when you look at game six and seven, he wasn't the only person who made mistakes and messed up. But after the game, it was one of the, that one of those things where, you know, he felt like he was thrown under the bus when people were bringing up and and, and people didn't have his back, so to speak. It was more or less, um, it wasn't we lost. It was more or less, well, you, you know what I mean? It yes, wasn't yes. really said, but, you know, it was one of those things. Yeah. And I, I want to get back to Doc's comment in a second. But if you can just put in perspective, because Ben was bad in those in that playoff series. And from a national perspective, we always heard, you know, Ben can't shoot and stuff. But Shaq couldn't shoot. But Shaq was a beast. Giannis Antetokounmpo can't hit free throws, but he just secured a championship. But, Keith, during that playoff run, there was times that Simmons didn't look like a professional basketball player. You referenced the play where he was under the basket, passed up an open dunk. So you, beat reporter, someone who's with these guys day in, covered them for years, if you could just put in perspective, how uncharacteristic was that performance, or is that in line with who he's always been? Um, in regard, I, I've, I've never seen him pass up dunks, you know, before. <laughs> you know, I've never seen that. Um, you know, I, I do think that, um, I, I think what happened to him was it got to the point, and it actually started in the first series against Washington, mm -hmm. where they start doing, like you said, they Shaq couldn't shoot, they did the hack of Shaq. Then they start doing the hack of Ben. Every time, like, you know, a certain point, they would intentionally foul him to get him to the foul line. And I think it got to a point where his mind starts saying, oh, man, oh, man. Like, he was trying not to get fouled. You understand? Yep. And, I, and I think that impacted his game. And I, I think he, he just wasn't himself. Now, again, is he the type of guy late in the game that typically has the ball in his hands on those situations? No. But I think that, you know, in this specific instance, this playoff series, it got to a point where he was struggling mightily and he just didn't want to go to the foul line. Right. With the Doc comment, Doc, that he was asked, do you have a championship level point guard? And Doc said, hey, I don't know, which is fair. You know, I think we all agree there. Uh, Charles Barkley and Shaquille O'Neal kind of been crushing Ben Simmons, saying he's not good enough to demand a trade. He needs to get better. I think we all agreed there but Keith what I want to ask you is how often is Ben Simmons confronted by the organization by his inability to shoot because 
if that was the very first time that he heard that from the organization, after we just got eliminated from the playoffs, uh, Doc is talking to a national media, I can understand why he views that as deceitful and betrayal. How often do they come to him and challenge him? Yo, Ben, you got to be better. I mean, he's been challenged, but not as much as you think. And I think it was, Doc Rivers kind of inherited a problem. You know, a couple of years ago, you know, Ben Simmons uh, was at the foul and he hit a three, right? Prime example, he hit a three. And he and uh, the coach asked him at the time, Brett Brown said to the media, you know, I would like to see Ben Simmons do at least tempt one, one a game from here on out. That was the last time he attempted a three that season. Wow. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and then, and then you know, you hear a story. So, in, in a way, it, he wasn't kind of held accountable. And I, I think where Ben felt like he was thrown under the bus is, you know, there was times when we would talk to Doc Rivers and, and like, they would do a hack of Ben. And you would say to Doc, did you ever consider taking Ben out of the game? Nah, if you guys want me to take him out of the game, then I know you don't know basketball. Like, he was right. getting, like, confrontational. So, he had Ben's back publicly. You know, he was like falling on a sword for this guy. And I think that in the biggest moment when they lost and when you say you don't know, you know, I think that that's what really upset Ben, you know, and that's what upset his camp, like feeling like, yo, this guy just threw him under the bus. You know what I mean? Right. And I saw like the media kind of piling on Ben Simmons. And that's kind of what I wanted to. Uh, uh, that's why I wanted to talk to you. Because, yes, those things are true. But you brought up a point. Doc may have inherited a problem where there's a lack of accountability. And, Keith, I go back. The Philadelphia 76ers is an organization that saw a general manager resign because he was accused of having a burner account and he was taking shots at his players through that burner account. Now, when I saw that, the story for me was, the things that he is saying, I think he said Joel B might be a little bit lazy or maybe selfish or he's struggling with the fact that it's Ben Simmons' team. Keith, those are things I want my general manager to be able to say face-to-face -face with the players. You know, uh, uh, Phil Jackson took shots at Mike. He wrote a book about Kobe saying uh, he was uncoachable. They paired that up and went on to win championships. Who is setting the tone in that organization? Uh, uh, what can you say about... I guess, the culture of accountability. Well, uh, I mean, it, you know, it, this is long. Like, I mean, it, it goes way back. I, I think that, you know, what happens is when you when you tank mm -hmm. and they tank for several years, it gets to a point where you want to keep the young guys happy. Mm -hmm. You don't have a lot of veterans there because, you know, a, a veteran wouldn't want to tank for like three straight years. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like they were giving out great contracts at that time, meaning like they weren't giving out a player a max or anything like that. Right. So it, when, when you get that, your goal is to keep players happy sometimes. And you don't have like the coaches and real rah, rah, you know, you, uh, you don't have the veterans saying, look, this is how we do it in the NBA rook. You better be here, get these extra shots. So you develop a lot of bad habits. And I think that's what happened. And when you look at it, you know, Again, you, you can say that could be a part of the culture of tanking. But when you look at it and all of a sudden, you know, your young stars become the, the superstars of the team, the face of the franchise. Mm -hmm. And then when you get people and come in and say, hey, look, man, this is how we do it. And you're like, what you mean this is how we do it? We haven't been doing it like this for the last four years. You know what I mean? I'm the man. I'm the man. And I'm not saying that's what Ben said, but that's just the type of you know, mentality that people have. So, you know, when you're trying to keep people happy, you're trying to do this, you're trying to do that, you know, that's not, you know, it's, it's great to empower the person, but in the long run, as we found out, it kind of put them, it hampered them. Because what should have happened is late, like when he was a rookie and some stuff and he was passing up shots and things like that, that's when the coach takes them out of the game and you have a teaching moment. But the problem was they were fearful that they would lose him. So they didn't do it. And let's face it, he was the front, he was a cornerstone. But I think 
You got to have veterans that say, hey, look, Rook, you got to carry the bags. You know, mm-hmm. hey, you know, this ain't what you do. You got to stay. You got to come early. You got to stay late. You got to work on your outside shot. You got to do this. You got to do that. And I, I think that's like a cultural thing, a problem that they had before then. Because I can't tell you who that person was, like I said. And I know there were some veterans who tried to say it, but they weren't of that caliber to where, you know, a guy would like listen, so to speak, you know? Yo, when Doc Rivers left the Los Angeles Clippers, Paul George had some comments, and he was ridiculed for kind of speaking out against Doc. Mm-hmm. Like who was who was Paul George to speak out against Doc? And then Doc leaves, and Paul George goes on a run in the playoffs, mm-hmm. right? So I, here is Doc in Philadelphia, which is kind of like the second year in a row for him that he has issues with players and, and, and the team. Wasn't Doc brought in to rectify all this? Isn't this the guy that put together three Hall of Famers in Boston to win a championship? Isn't he the, the, supposed to be the unifier, Keith? Yeah, but I don't think you can put all the blame on him. Like, you know, it, it, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the thing is, I, I think that, you know, Doc is a player's coach. Like, you know, we heard what Paul Pierce said in the Hall of Fame. I showed up at, for a shoot around drunk. Hung over, rather. Showed up hung over, which is a difference in being drunk. He was he was hung over and, and Doc told him to go back to the room, to the hotel room, and be ready for the game tonight. You know what I mean? So, you know, with that being said, the thing the, the thing about Doc Rivers is when you talk to people and you're around him, he's the type of guy who, you know, he's kind of like I said, that player's coach. He tries to encourage you now. He'll get on you within the locker room and all that stuff. Um, but he won't kind of blast you like these other people say, like mm-hmm. Phil Jackson and stuff. That's just not his stick. Now, stick. Now, the problem is when you come in and you're a coach of a city, especially your first year, mm-hmm. and we're talking about where the offseason wasn't as long, you basically meet these guys a couple of days before training camp comes, so to speak, you come in and you inherit a lot of problems. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like it's going to be one of them gradual things. You know what I mean? And I think that he was trying to keep things together. Now, again, I get it. You know, they did the, uh, you know, the, um, the the Clippers did go further than what they did with <laughs> Doc. They did. I get that. And, you know, and everybody talk about, you know, these second round exits and, and things like that. You know, I, I get all that, um, you know, but and, and and I think that, you know, Doc was I think with the sister situation, I mean, I, I can't speak for him, but my impression is that he knew that this team had had some some problem, but he was like coaching it up because let's keep it real. As good as they were, whenever they played a a, a really good team, Towards the end of the season, they was taking L's. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, when they was him. So, but but yeah, I get it. I I, I mean, I, I get what Paul George was saying and all this and that. But I think the the fair thing to judge them would have been the second year. The second year. Okay. I I just believe in that create that creative tension. You know, right there in Philly. Larry Brown and Allen Iverson, you know, they were butt heads at time, but the result was an MVP season and a finals appearance. And I just believe, like, when you don't hold guys accountable, a team can't reach its, its maximum potential. And I'm sure Embiid is part of that as well. All right. Keith, with the front office, I know a few years ago we were celebrating Elton Brand, a former player, a, a black man is going to be running an organization. And then here comes Daryl Morey. The Philadelphia Sixers signed him, somebody whose career we thought was on, on a scrap heap after he caused an international incident. Like, who running the shows up there? I mean, who's running the show? Who's calling the shots? How does that work? Daryl Morey calling the shots. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the dude making, I mean, some people say he's making 12 something. Some people say he's making, uh, making 10. I mean, it, it's Daryl Morey right now. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, he's the president of basketball ops. I mean, the thing you got to understand about Daryl Morey, Daryl Morey is like one of the most guys involved in analytics, right? Mm-hmm. You know, 
you look at him, you see how James Harden thrived under him and, and Dan Tony. You you look at um, some of the success he had. Now, again, I get it. You know, they said he was on the strap heaps, and everybody said he was going to be in trouble after that thing with China. Yes. But, I mean, the funny thing is they said that, but the, but the owner never fired him <laughs> because he was bringing that money in for him. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I, I think like Daryl came in here and, and you know, Daryl, be honest with you, Daryl's a guy that the 76ers wanted for a long time. Like, you know, they hired Sam Hinkie, who was a Daryl Morey disciple because they couldn't get Daryl Morey. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like when they went out there and, and they made Brett Brown, the uh, the acting general manager and Elton Brand ended up becoming the GM. Well, they they wanted a guy like Daryl Morey. They wanted Daryl Morey. So right now, yeah, he's running the show. Um, you know, Elton, you know, uh, you know, Elton was, you know, he was a GM for a couple of years, and we know Daryl had all this and that. But when it comes down to it, if someone has like the final decision to make, you know, you best believe it's gonna be Daryl Morey. All right. Keith, if you were betting, man, how does this play out? The situation with Ben Simmons. I think he gets traded, man. I mean, he, I, he does. Now, you know, there's always something new coming out, and, and it always happens that way. Like there's, a, you know, teams, a, new teams uh, popping up, being interested. Of course, the Sixers are saying, like, well, if he doesn't come, he's going to be fine. We expect him to show up and this and that. <laughs> well, I mean, you look at it, that's what you have to say, right? Because – you know, you, you, you have to say that because if you don't say if you don't say that, if you don't say that, then all of a sudden, you know, what happens if um, his value just gets lower and lower? You know, even if you don't have control of the situation, you want people to think that you do. Yeah. And I'm not saying they don't. But what else do you expect a team to say? You understand what I'm saying? Yes, indeed. Keith Pompey. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me, my man. All right, take care.